Michelle, so um, this is a great pleasure to be here playing some jazz for you today. And um, I, I got an introduction, I appreciate that. Ms. Harrigan, who was a wonderful conductor of the Battle Creek Symphony. I want to make sure you know who else is up here. I hope I don't mess up the names, and I'll tell you why I'm worried about that in a moment. This is uh, Jerry McDowell. Here's McDowell, right? Yes, the piano. Sounds great. And, uh, you might not be able to tell in all the cases from the distance, but they're all way younger than I am. You know, even, even the man with the full impressive beard is clearly much younger than I am. And uh, this is uh, Duncan Tarr on the bass. And Sam Gould on the drums. And here's the kind of thing that, that you see a lot in jazz setting that is not quite as, as common in other genres of music, is um, we just kind of got together to play. We, I, I've never met these guys before. And so, you don't always see that sort of thing in all settings. I mean, sometimes classical musicians might have to do that, but usually they can at least have some sort of rehearsal. Um, but what's very typical with jazz musicians is you know kind of a, a set of tunes, and all these guys know some tunes that I don't know. I might know some tunes that they don't know, but there's sort of a central body of music that we all tend to know. And so when I knew we were going to play for you all, we decided, hey, hey we're not really going to have rehearsal. How about these tunes? What do you think? And they decided. They said it was fine, so we they, we threw it together without a rehearsal. Is there a little bit of risk involved? Yeah, sometimes weird things happen, but that's also kind of part of the excitement of the music for jazz musicians. One of the skills that we try to develop as a musician is sort of being able to accommodate whatever happens that was not expected and try to make it into something cool, into something instead of something that calls the music to, to kind of train right. So that first tune we did it was uh, made famous by uh, Duke Ellington. Um, he's a guy some of you might have heard of. He's considered perhaps America's greatest composer, if not the best and one of the most important and greatest composers in, in American music history, not just jazz history, but in terms of music generally. And the song was actually written by uh, someone who played this band. His name was Juan Tizal, and he played a very unusual instrument, the valve trombone. You probably haven't seen too many of those. Most of the time, you think of the trombone with the slide, right? I know some of you are musicians, some of you are not, so some of this will be more obvious to some of you <laughs> than, than others. But he played a foul trombone, he wrote the song, and Duke's orchestra made it really famous, traveling on the long playing this tune. And I, um, one thing I want to do a little bit is talk about some of the different, um, different styles of jazz, different periods. We're going to go back to play, and, and Caravan itself is interesting too because it's a very old song, but it's really easy to give a modern treatment in terms of rhythm and harmony, which is one reason why jazz musicians always like to play it. We're going to play a tune now that's kind of, since a little more than an older style period, this is something that uh, Louis Armstrong played among many other great artists. Louis Armstrong was maybe the first great jazz soloist to ever come along, and he's still considered by many to be perhaps the greatest jazz performer in the history of the music. And this is a tune called All of Me.
I'm thinking of a different sound and a different way of playing the field. The phrasing is different. Sam was doing a completely different uh, approach on the drums to what he was doing on, on Caravan. And this is something you see when you're dealing with different styles of music, of course. And it's really interesting. Um, of course, jazz is probably not one of the most, uh, let's say, it doesn't have the biggest audience, of course, in this country, but it has a lot of its real devoted fans. What's interesting, though, is that most musicians are checking out all kinds of music all the time. And so lots of times musicians, um, the genre, the type of music, is not as important in terms of whether they want to check it out. It's more about figuring out what's rich about each genre, you know. So I, my, myself, for example, I'm uh, trained as a classical musician, and I play a lot of jazz, and all these gentlemen will probably have some kind of background in terms of classical music and jazz in their training. But I check out all kinds of pop and rock music as well, because I learn from musicians in that uh, type of music or genre. And you also find people on the other side, rock and pop musicians checking out jazz musicians and classical musicians, and that's part of what keeps everything really rich and interesting. So one thing we want to demonstrate now is um, a different style. This is gonna. This is an old tune that's often played as a ballad. It's called "You Don't Know What." Uh, is that the right one? Yeah, you don't know what love is. And but we're gonna do it more as a as sort of a Brazilian style uh, derived feel. This is this is a bossa, and um, we hope you enjoy this tune. It's called "You Don't Know What Love Is."
I mentioned, we, you know, we haven't really played together before. But one other cool thing that sometimes will be part of jazz performances, we don't really know what sort of form the, the performances are going to take. So in the case of all these songs, we know there's a melody, there's a chord progression, there's a form, a certain number of measures, there's a way we, you know, we conceive of the structure of the tune. But we're not sure how long everyone's going to solo for. Like Jared took a solo, and it's kind of typical to take one time through the whole form, which is what he did, but he might have taken two times. It might have taken three times if he really felt like he had a lot to say. We don't know. And so we sort of feel up by, you know, as we go here. At the end there, I took sort of a little cadenza that as I sort of played something on my own. These guys didn't know what I was going to do. They might have thought I was crazy, except they've seen people do that kind of thing before. So like, okay, he's kind of going off on his own a little bit for a minute. And they're all great musicians, so they saw it, stayed out of my way, waited for me to cue it, and they came back in. And I knew because as soon as I started playing with these guys, like, man, these guys are great, so I can, I can try some things, and, and I know they're going to be, they're going to be hip with it, you know. So um, let's see now. We're going to play another tune now. This is a some of you may have heard of Herbie Hancock, who was a, a great jazz musician who came up in the gosh, right at the beginning of the '60s, I guess he first came on the scene. He's still active, he's like in his 80s now, incredible musician. And he had a big hit way back, I think it was like maybe 64 something, 62, guys, the caliber, 62, 64, something like that. It was on uh, the Imperial Isles, right? Pick that up. And so this is a, this is a you know, jazz musicians basically learn the, the history through recordings, you know, same thing with most pop and rock musicians. Unlike a lot of classical musicians who, while they rely on recordings to learn things, lots of times what's most important is the written score to kind of gives them the information they need to, to deal with the music. But for us, the history of the music is all about the recordings. And so, this was a famous tune called Cantaloupe Island, and uh, we hope you enjoy it.
Great, thank you. So now I think um, we got something a little different, a little special treat. Uh, we have some of your uh, your classmates who are going to come up and play a song with us. Y'all want to come up? We have a trombonist, a couple of trumpets, and a baritone saxophone. I believe there's a guitarist who's around. I don't know if you had. I think he was going to come, but he wasn't sure he could be here, so he might not have his uh, hand. But cool. So um, we're going to play a blues for y'all. So when I say a blues, what I mean, well, blues in particular form, that's had a, a huge influence on the history of, of so many different kinds of music, from straight up urban blues like B.B. King and Marty Waters and those guys, to the jazz musicians, um, to rock and roll. I mean, Led Zeppelin, those guys basically were a blues man, essentially. They went off in all kinds of interesting directions and all kinds of bands. Check them out. And Rolling Stone, same thing. Of course, so so this this form of music has had a huge influence on the history um, of Western pop music and music generally. So we're gonna play um, once again. We we just met these folks. We didn't get rehearsed with them. Actually, we kind of had a rehearsal by 30 seconds before. I was like, I was like, here's here's the melody we're gonna play. So I showed them the melody. This is maybe the the simplest blues edge you can find. Gonna, this is called. The original title is C Jam Blues. We're changing the key from C to B flat, so it's B flat Jam Blues. And, and I'll remind you guys how this melody goes. <laughs> Always a scary thing to do. All right, but this is just all going to be fun, though. So here we go. B flat, jam blues.
Jack, um, hang up here for a second in case, because I, I want to see, you know, if people have any questions about what we're doing, how the music works, all that kind of stuff, I wanted to give you a chance to ask, and it could be directed at your colleagues up here as well. Anyone, you want to have any questions? Yes? The three different instruments I'm playing, I've actually played, I guess, two of them so far, but I have, um, this is your standard B-flat trumpet, same as you see on here I have. I also have a flugelhorn. Which as you probably notice has a very different sound. It's a much warmer kind of rounder sound. I also have a piccolo trumpet, which is not the most um, common instrument to be played in jazz, but I play, I'll play a couple notes on it because I don't even know if I'll play it on a tune here, but I brought it out just in case. That's the thing, we don't always know what's going to happen beforehand playing jazz, that's part of the excitement. But I'll, I'll show you what it sounds like because it's very different than the regular trumpet. Saxophones have their soprano saxophone, so why not sort of a high soprano trumpet? And so those, those are the three instruments. Any other questions? Or follow-up questions? Uh, oh, I'm sorry, yes. Oh, she's asked about the rivets on the cymbals. And can you tell us what those what those are for? Sure. sure. I'm bringing the mic. Okay. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, these are uh, metal rivets that are um, fastened to the cymbal. There's actually, if you if you were to come up here and look, several holes drill, drilled around um, the edge of the cymbal. And then the uh, rivets are fastened from the bottom. So when you strike the cymbal, they uh, vibrate sympathetically. Versus. Thank you, Sam. Great. Any other questions? Then I will thank you folks for setting up. We have, uh, we have time for one more tune. And uh, so we're going to play another jazz favorite. This is a favorite among jazz musicians. This is called I'll Remember April. Seems kind of fitting when we just had a bunch of snow. We're all kind of ready for spring. And um, this, we're going to do this with, with a samba feel, so something else kind of coming out of, come out of Brazil, Brazilian tradition. And uh, I want to thank all of you for being such a great audience, for coming and listening. Um, you've been great. I appreciate your attention and your, um, your support. Giving us some applause for our souls and all that kind of stuff. Thank you. Once again, this is Jared McDowell on the piano. Guitar, sound fantastic. The bass, the sound playing, sounding wonderful, and having an awesome beard too. And uh, I want to thank the Battle Creek Symphony for bringing us in because this is a privilege and a pleasure for us to work with them. Here we go. I'll have a good day.
Trevor Patel on the piano. Fucking Tom the bass. Sound over the drums, and all this right.